most famous Bible story. If people don't know about the Bible, they would have heard about this. Let me see if you can guess what it is. We're going to start by reading from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14. And then I'm going to read from Jonah. Jonah. 2 Kings 14, verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, with which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hepha. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. And if you'd like to turn with me or look on the screen, I'm going to read the first three verses of the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord's. We thank God for his words. In a moment, it's going to be time for boys and girls to go out. Well, if you have the book of Jonah open, that will help you. There are Bibles at the back. Jonah. Jonah is a book about the character of the God who is there, the God of the Bible. And Jonah asks each one of us a question. Jonah taps us on the shoulder and says, where are you with this God? And how like this God are you? In the first three verses, there are three things that hit us. One particularly hits us around the chops like a wet fish. So I've got three things to say. First thing I want you to notice in verse 1, the obedience that the Lord requires. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, I wonder if you've ever had this experience. You're walking along, there's a pair of sunglasses on the floor. You pick them up and you put them on to contain the, uh, to find that those sunglasses contain a secret message from a top secret organ spy organization with a, a mission should you choose to accept it. If you have had that experience, your name is probably Tom Cruise or Ethan Hawke, and please afterwards, we'd all like your uh, um, autograph. If that does happen to you, take the sunglasses off before they explode and self-destruct. Now, the whole point of the Mission Impossible films, Mission Impossible 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, ad infinitum, the whole point of it is not the mission that Ethan Hunt has done in the past, not whatever mission he had done. The whole point is, what is he going to do in the present? Will he accept the mission now? And the whole point of the start of Jonah is... What will Jonah do in the presence as the word of God comes to him now? The word of the Lord came to. That's a phrase used over a hundred times to describe what happens when the living covenant God of Israel spoke to his servants, the prophets. 
God's self-revelation, his word pressed in on them with a particular message, with particular instructions. So this is the God of the Bible. He's not silence. He speaks. Now here we're about eight centuries before the birth of Jesus. Let me give you some background. After the reign of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split into two, with the smaller kingdom of Judah in the south and the larger kingdom of Israel or Samaria in the north. Now that northern kingdom, while retaining lip service to the God of Israel, plunged into false worship of other gods, into corruption and disobedience. And during that time of the split kingdoms, you get the rise of the prophets. These are men, servants of the Lord, commissioned and called by God to speak God's word to God's people. If you like, their covenant policemen, often accompanied with miraculous signs, pronouncing judgments on disobedience and proclaiming the mercy and grace of the covenant gods. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha. And again, you hear this word, the word of the Lord came to them, sometimes with a particular message, sometimes with particular instructions. And Jonah's ministry is, if, if you like, it just after Elijah and Elisha's. And you get 12 what we call minor prophets, the last part of the Old Testament. Very often, what you get is their message. You get what they said to Israel at particular times. Jonah is different because it's about Jonah himself. It's a, a narrative like the stories we get, the accounts we get of Elijah and Elisha. Jonah, God's word comes to Jonah. Now, Jonah, that word means dove in Hebrew. Amittai, his son of Amittai, that means truthfulness or faithfulness. The big thing is not so much what his name means, but how Jonah had been used in the past. I read to you the only other place in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, where we hear of Jonah. We hear of him and the reign of King Jeroboam the second, who was a particularly vicious and evil king. And yet the Lord had blessed Israel because of his grace. He hadn't said he would blot them out. And it was a time of prosperity for Israel. And he increased their borders and they grew as a nation. And that was, according to God's word, spoken by a Jonah, son of Amittai, from Gath Hefer. That's a place in the north of Israel, near Nazareth, near Galilee. And so Jonah has been used by God for his people Israel. He's had success. He has spoken a word of extending borders, and it has happened. Uh, Jonah has got past faithfulness behind him, and yet here the word of the Lord comes to him uh, saying, go, arise, do this now. But he's to go not to Israel. He's to go to the enemy of Israel, Nineveh, which is one of the prominent cities of the Assyrian Empire. And so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Whatever obedience and blessing Jonah has known behind him, it's what the word of God is saying to him now. Arise and go. Arise and go. Whatever past obedience, whatever blessing or fruitfulness, whatever success, the priority, priority for Jonah is to personally obey the voice of God now. And however uncomfortable that is, however it explodes his uh, categories, however shocking it is to be sent to his enemies, he is to obey. In the Old Testament, you get the prophets speaking about the nations, prophesying about their enemies surrounding them. 
Here we have a prophet being instructed to go to the nations. The principle here is the same for each one of us. If we're Christians, you might come to me this morning and say, well, Pete, I have been used by God. I was in a a Bible study that was blessed for seven, eight years. I was in a small church and we saw people saved. I've been involved in the mission field. I've been involved in, in camp work. I've been involved in this youth club. It's really gone really well. I've been involved in this missionary. And that's great. That is really good. We thank God for his blessings. But like Jonah, it's in the past. How are you responding to the word of God now? It's present obedience that matters, whatever is in the past. It's the same priority that Jesus says, where he implies that he has priority over father, mother. Jesus says, whoever doesn't take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus assumes that he has the right to present obedience, highest priority. You might say to me this morning, well, actually, as a Christian, I'm not that great. Uh, I haven't done that much. I'm just little old me, just trundling along, going to school, going to my work, going to my youth club. There's not that much that's great about me. And say, well, that doesn't matter either, because it's present obedience that counts. Where are you with what God is saying through his word now, this morning? You might be somebody who's not a Christian at all. You might have no track record with God. The question is, how are you responding to God's word, this gospel that's coming to you now? Jonah hits us with the obedience that God requires. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to that great city of Nineveh. So if it's about the obedience that God requires, it's also about the extent of God's rule, the extent of the Lord's rule. That's the second thing I want you to think about from these verses. Uh, Welcome to North Wales if you're on holiday. Just like to say, we're in the place of mobile phone black spots. There are valleys down here. There are towns where you cannot get a signal at all. It might um, uh, kind of strike you as curious, but there are all places, communities, they can't get a Wi-Fi, internet kind of connection. You can't get broadband or what, whatever it is. There are black spots. And of course, we've seen in the news, uh, uh, IT infrastructure, there are things that it can't do. They are kind of black spots. There's things that it can't do. Here's an assumption that's right at the start of the book of Jonah. And it's so important. We can plow on into the story and miss this assumption. It's a biblical assumption that a lot of Christians forget and most of the non-Christian world doesn't acknowledge. There are no black spots to God's sovereignty. There is not a place in the whole earth that God doesn't rule over and isn't accountable to him. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So Nineveh was one of the the main cities of the Assyrian Empire that had risen to prominence in the 8th century. At this particular time, It was knowing a little bit of dearth, a little bit of decline. And um, Israel, the northern kingdom, was knowing some uh, respite from it. Uh, Nineveh, modern Nineveh, if you would know from hearing about Iraq and stuff, you would know the city of Mosul. Uh, um, The the ancient city of Nineveh is opposite Mosul in uh, Iraq there. At this point, it's not just one city, but a large network of towns, a huge area, a prominent city, and associated, particularly steeped in idolatry, a very violent place, a place that had been bitterly violent against Israel and their people, a hated, crushing superpower, a place of violence. 
And it's come to the particular point where this city, its evil, has got to such an extent that the Lord is sending Jonah to cry out against it for its wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The Lord says, it's come up to me. The assumption is that the Lord is up. He reigns over the whole world. This is the God of the Tower of Babel, the God of the flood, the God of Sodom and Gomorrah, the God of justice who reigns over and even pagan nations who don't acknowledge him are accountable to him for his wicked, for their wickedness and rebellion. This is the God. There are no black spots to his sovereignty. The Lord has the right to cry out against its sin and rebellion. They are under his judgments. This is really important assumption, a basic biblical assumption, because the world around us says, well, you know, if I choose to believe it or not, that's up to me. Uh, people assume, well, that you Christians, you're in your kind of, you've got your Wi-Fi Bible connection, and it works for you Christians if you believe it, but I'm offline, so none of that is to do with me. The Bible says no. The Bible says there are no black spots. God made absolutely everything, the living God of the Bible, and every man, woman, boy and girl is accountable to him for how they've lived. And an unbelieving world, God is justly angry with wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And that uh, accounts for the West and the UK, all the nations of the earth, all the cities, all the places, all the Ninevehs of this world. Let me spell that out. So the whole human race is accountable for not worshipping the living God and loving him. The whole human race is accountable for not honouring this God and turning to wrong ideas, false worship, false religions. The whole human race is accountable for not honouring marriage. It's accountable for its sexual sin. It's accountable for unnatural relations. It's accountable for how it's treated children. It's accountable for not respecting parents. It's accountable for its greed for its injustice, it's accountable for its inflated view of itself, it's accountable for its theft, it's accountable for its wickedness. It is accountable. Do we see those things in the world around us? Do we see our society, a society like that? Yes, we do. That is a society that God is justly angry with, and he has the right to cry out against its sin. It is accountable to him. And where we see little upsets, where we see little things, well, big things, rattling us, a pandemic, a war, a, a, a computer system failing, a, a political system that is tearing itself apart, where we see unrest, the Bible would have us see these as little judgments, warnings of something much, much greater. Do you see the assumption? The extent of God's rule is everywhere, and all the nations of the earth are accountable to him. But what I want you to see with that assumption is another assumption underneath it that in the book of Jonah will kind of bloom to become the main theme. And it's this. Why does God warn Nineveh? Why does God send Jonah to warn the people of Nineveh? And the answer is, he's got purposes of judgment, but he also has purposes of mercy. Purposes of mercy. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18 is a good verse in this regard because it lays out the kind of template of prophecy. The Lord says in Gen Jeremiah 18 verse 7, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I planned. Why does God warn Nineveh? 
The Lord is sovereign in judgment. He is sovereign in grace and mercy. He's got plans to forgive and pardon. And actually, that's the thing that Jonah doesn't like. That's the thing that Jonah doesn't like. God's got plans of grace. This world in all its bigness and badness, and the the Bible cries out against its sin. Faithful Christian witness needs to cry out against its sin. Why? Because the Lord delights to show mercy and grace. He's got plans of grace. There's a great story I love about the Methodist preacher, John Wesley, hundreds of years ago, about 400 years ago, 300 years ago, going to preach in Newcastle. And in his um, journal, he writes this, Newcastle is a wicked city, full of drunkenness and immorality. And he lists all the vices of Newcastle back then. And it's a horrid place, a bit like you might list all the vices of 21st century UK. And he says, surely this place is ripe for And just when you think he's going to say judgments, he says, this place is ripe for mercy. So I preach the gospel there. God, the extent of his rule is incredible. He has purposes of judgment and grace for a world in its rebellion. So the obedience that God requires, the extent of God's rule. And here's the thing. This is the thing. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, that hits you around the face like a wet fish. It's the mystery of our rebellion and our refusal to serve gods. Because that's the words. Preach against it. Its wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. May 2020. The Las Vegas police force uh, put up this post on their Facebook page. How did that get there? What had happened is they discovered in the desert in Nevada, as out of the blue overnight appeared, a kind of eight foot metallic structure that was uh, kind of cube shaped, rectangled, going up, surgical steel, as if it had just landed there. No footprints, no trace of any tracks around it. It just appeared in the desert. How did that get there? And then one appeared a couple of years ago in uh, the Isle of Wight. And then one appeared uh, in uh, Hay or Mai. What is that doing there? How did that get there? And one appeared at Glastonbury with uh, writing on the side saying, this is not a Banksy, which tells you it's not aliens, whatever it is. We think, what is that doing there? How did that get there? It's a mystery. It kind of draws you in. It explodes your brain a bit. How did that get there? And it's a bit like Jonah here. What is he doing running away from the Lord? In the Bible, again and again, the word of the Lord comes to a prophet and the prophet goes. That's what prophets do. They go with the word of the Lord. That's what they're supposed to do. Sometimes the prophet tries to wriggle out of it like Moses. Sometimes the prophet struggles with it like Jeremiah. But they always, always go. But here we get Jonah hot in it in the opposite direction. In fact, it says twice in those verses, he ran away from the presence of of the Lord. He ran away from the presence of the Lord. Now we're not to think, because we might say, Jonah, haven't you read Psalm 139? Don't you know that there's nowhere that you can go from the presence of God? Jonah knows that. Jonah knows that God is everywhere. That phrase, the presence of the Lord, the prophets were to stand in God's presence, in, in his felt presence, they were to obey him. So he's not running away from God's sovereignty, even though his running is, is, is stupid in the light of God's sovereignty. He's running away from service to the Lord. He's running away from Project Nineveh. He doesn't want to do it. He wants somebody else to do it. He wants no part in warning of judgment of the wicked Ninevites. And three times you get he's going to Tarshish. 
is going to Tarshish. Where's Tarshish? We don't know. A long, long way away into the Mediterranean. When it's uh, the two other times that's mentioned in the Old Testament, it's always like uh, an example of a place that's a long, long way away. Um, in Wales, we say, well, in South Wales, they say Upper Kentuck. Upper Kentuck is down the back of beyond. It's Upper Valley. We've been there once. It's just a place that's a long, long, long way away. He's trying to get as far away from Nineveh and of service to the Lord as he could. He goes down to Joppa on the coast. He goes, uh, pays for a ship. Uh, Israelites have a, in the Old Testament, don't like the sea. They don't like seafaring. It, it tells you how resolute he is on getting away from God and on this responsibility to serve him. He doesn't want to be involved. What is he doing there? Literally, even before we get to chapter two, Jonah is a fish out of water. He is where he shouldn't be. What is this all about? It's a Scottish Bible commentator, Alexander White, who wrote this. Who is Jonah? Who is Jonah? And the Bible commentator says, as I've thought about this and thought about my own heart, I can say that I am Jonah. I am Jonah. That's my story, running away from God. We might say that Jonah reflects what Israel, northern Israel, were doing at that time. Very often, the prophets kind of, by their lives, show something to Israel. Israel were running away from their calling to be a light to the nations. They uh, were running away from serving God by turning to idols. This is what Israel were doing as a whole. But it's also what God's people often do, where what God is like and where God want, what God wants kind of crashes into what we think God should be like and what we want. And we try and avoid this God. There's something that can happen, these verse says, in the heart of a servant of God, where when our agenda doesn't fit in with God's agenda, we want out. We want out. And here we have a runaway prophet. And it's worth searching ourselves as Christians. We might not go to the extent of uh, going vast distances. There's all kinds of ways you can avoid God's words and turn the volume down on the implications of God's grace in your life. There's all kinds of ways we can dodge and deflect it. Do you see that hunch to escape from things that we don't like, that don't fit in with our purposes? Can you be Jonah-like? And actually, the story of Jonah running away from God. It's not just the story of God's people, it's the story of the whole human race. Adam and Eve in the garden, when God comes, they run away from the presence of the Lord. They hide from this God. That's what we all instinctively do. The mystery of our rebellion. It's like a goldfish jumping out the goldfish bowl saying, I'm free, I'm free, I'm going to go my own way. And you say, you stupid goldfish, your life is in the bowl. Our life is bound up in knowing the presence of God. And yet in lots of ways, we try and escape it. Is that you, a runaway prophet, which sets up something in the rest of the book of Jonah? Here we have a wicked city, Nineveh, that God desires to show mercy and judgment to. Here we have a runaway prophet. The whole point is God is going to do something. He's not going to let Jonah go. Then my wife heard a talk once where somebody said, they preached the gospel and they said this, well, God is... Well, it was a version of the gospel, and the version was this. God is a gentleman. He's a perfect gentleman. So he won't intrude in your life, and he'll just wait patiently. And if you want to, God will come and help you now. It is true God is patient and kind and gracious, and Jesus is gentle and lowly. 
It's absolutely true. It's really important we don't take a truth and make it a half truth. Because if you said to Jonah, as he's on the ship, God is a perfect gentleman. He won't intrude in your life if you don't want him to. Jonah would have said, great, I'll take that. That sounds fantastic. Because that's not what happens. God is not a gentleman here. He comes crashing in on Jonah's life and grace goes after Jonah, even though he doesn't want him. That is the God of the Bible. We don't want to know this God. We wouldn't choose him. We don't want him in our lives. And praise God that he's not a gentleman in that sense. Praise God for outrageous grace that goes after rebels, that takes them back, that subdues their wills. Sovereign grace over sin abounding. That is the movement of the first three verses of Jonah. And that is the movement of the gospel. Because God does not say to a wicked world, to wicked nations who don't want to know him, to a disobedient people who don't want to serve him. God does not say, well, okay, if you want it like that, he doesn't do it. He sends his son into the world as a human, a faithful prophet who obeys God, who goes to death, even death on a cross. What I'm telling you is this morning, there is grace greater than your sin, greater than your tantrums, greater than your hissy fits, greater than your disobedience, greater than your blackouts where you think God can't see what you're doing. There is grace that will keep you and save you and rescue you. There was a man called Peter Jeffrey who was preaching about 20, 30 years ago at the Aberystwyth Conference. And he looked up at the congregation. He said, some of you don't want to know God, know God at all, but God is after you and he'll have you. And that is the sovereign God who went after Jonah. Praise God for his grace. Shall we stand to sing? Oh.